In the early days of the pandemic, right before the governor's stay at home order, I visited a grocery store here in my neighborhood. It was a pretty poorly kept secret that there was some kind of order coming down. And like everybody else, I didn't know what was next or what to expect. So I probably bought more groceries than I should have. As I approached the checkout, an elderly gentleman approached me and he asked, are you Cam Buckner? I said, I am. And I smiled. He said, I voted for you. I thanked him. He then took his attention to my cart that was overflowing with groceries. He looked back at me and said, I only came here to get a few things. I've been through way worse things than this pandemic. But if you're scared, knowing all that you know, then I should be too. That's the thing about political leadership. A simple act like going to the grocery store can send signals to your constituents, and they act on those signals. I represent the most racially and socioeconomically diverse district in the state of Illinois. And Illinois is one of the most diverse states in the entire country. So by the transit property, I represent one of the most diverse districts in the entire country. I represent neighborhoods like Washington Park, who for years have struggled with disinvestment, poverty, lack of access to health care, and violence. The life expectancy in Washington Park is 69 years old. I also represent places like Streeterville, one of the centers of Chicago's economic engines, home to world-renowned medical institutions, universities, and Chicago landmarks like Navy Pier. The life expectancy in Streeterville is 90 years old. This is TEDx Wrigleyville, but we are not in Wrigley Field. We stand here in the middle of Bronzeville, my neighborhood, because the day I was supposed to film at Wrigley Field, the building that stood in this spot was burning to the ground. On May 25th in Minneapolis, an unarmed black man was killed by police, and it sparked unrest around the country, including here in Chicago and here in my neighborhood. For generations, this neighborhood figuratively burned, burned because of disinvestment, burned because of abuse, burned because of neglect. But last week, that figurative burning turned into literal burning, and stores up and down main thoroughfares were looted. People were mad, people were angry, and there was pain. The thing about crisis is that it affects all of us, but it doesn't necessarily affect all of us equally. I've seen that during this pandemic. As I've been out in the community, meeting with people, talking to constituents, handing out personal protective equipment and meals, I've heard people loud and clear. What they have said is that they are hurting. The source of the pain is all the same, but the specifics are different. Like the elderly woman on the Gold Coast who owns a bunch of multi-unit buildings in the city. She's worried what rent reduction will do to her on her fixed income and how to legally and safely show her open units to potential occupants. Or the college student in Woodlawn who has been forced to complete the last semester of her college career online. No graduation, no celebration of her accomplishments, and to boot, no job prospects now that school's over. Or the single mother in Woodline, who works three jobs just to make ends meet, who has not been able to ever afford reliable internet access, but now the lack of broadband worries her because her fourth grade son continues to get booted off of his virtual class sessions. I've talked to my colleagues around the country and around the state. And we all are dealing with the same trauma that our constituents are. Leadership is defined in many ways. There are many types of leaders. There are leaders in the familial structure, the mother, the father, the older sibling, who the entire family looks to. There is leadership in the corporate world, the CEO, the person in charge, she or he with whom the proverbial buck stops. And there's leadership in our communities, the people who spend their entire lives focused on bettering the lives of others. I've been fortunate to be in many leadership positions. And what I know for sure is that most leaders feel better about leading when we have more facts from which to lead. 
The unknown is scary. Human nature is to want to know what's next. Without those guideposts, we often find ourselves stumbling. We often find ourselves freezing and panicking when leadership is required. When there's an absence of things from which to peg your leadership to, what do leaders do? My advice to leaders when there aren't reliable facts is to follow these four rules. Number one, the 4070 rule. Former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, National Security Advisor, and Secretary of State Colin Powell has an off-sided rule that he goes by when it comes to making leadership decisions when there's a lack of information. General Powell says we should never make pivotal decisions with less than 40% of needed information. And we should never make pivotal decisions with more than 70% of that same needed information. The logic behind this is that if you make the decision with less than 40% of the information, you're shooting from the hip. You're being impulsive and you're leaving way too much room for error. If you make the decision with more than 70% of needed information, you've most likely waited too long and you've not made the decision at the most pivotal point. Number two, lead with the long game in mind. Way too often as leaders, we get bogged down with right, what's right in front of us. We're not thinking about the next thing that's coming. As leaders, we have to lead with an eye towards the future. But that's hard, I'll be honest. We are often judged by what happens in the now. The CEO gets booted by the board of directors based on quarterly earnings. The sports coach gets fired in the middle of the season after a 10 game losing streak. The politician loses the next election based on that one vote that she or he made. But when we're leading in crisis, we have to remind ourselves that this is not about the next election, that this is about the next generation. And the things we decide today will have long lasting consequences that will reverberate much longer than we are alive. Number three, leaders must protect the vulnerable. The way you judge society should be by the way they treat the youngest and the oldest among them, and how the least vulnerable are treated as well. This includes folks who are sick, incarcerated, and down on their luck. It also includes communities who have historically dealt with poverty, death, and healthcare issues. Number four, comfort. Leaders are supposed to provide comfort to the least comfortable and to the most afflicted. But how does a leader do that when a leader, him or herself, are also uncomfortable? In the early 90s, Bill Clinton was heckled by a protester. And the president quipped back to the protester, I feel your pain. Feeling each other's pain is not enough. Leaders are required to take the understanding of their pain and to be actionable in order to comfort the afflicted. Local leaders play a very pivotal role. In the age of the 24-hour news cycle and constant content, our governors, our mayors, and the president are zoomed into our home every day. We know them because we see them. But do they really know us? Local leaders have our finger on the pulse of our communities. We understand the boots on the ground because we are the boots on the ground. And therefore, we are inextricably linked with the people whom we serve. In the middle of the social unrest here in Chicago, I watched as that grocery store that I told you about in the beginning was boarded up after being damaged and vandalized. A few days later, I joined with my community members and friends to help clean that store up. And yesterday I went to that store and it reopened. What that reminds me of is when people work together and people come together, there is no barrier that we can't overcome. What I also know to be true is that distance does not separate us. Silence does. And that's for that man who noticed me and my cart in the grocery store, who had been through enough in his lifetime to not be worried about a pandemic, but also believed enough in our system that he still exercised his right to vote and could pick out his state representative in a crowded grocery store, who used my behavior as a litmus test for how he should act. I too used his behavior as a litmus test for how I should lead 
Leadership is about leaning in, especially in a crisis, especially when there are limited facts, especially when you're vulnerable and you're scared.